Hi there. I'm Ken Leon Guerrero. And today's topic is meeting number five. I'm here at the University of Guam School of uh, Business and Public Administration. And today we are going to talk about six initiatives, but I want to tell you a little story. And that story comes from the words of Lord Acton, who said, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's what we've seen on Guam for decades here, is our politicians get braver and bolder, taking advantage of the trust we gave them with our votes, and then they turn around and use the power we gave them against us. And we need look no further than Guam Water Authority, where the board, or the CCU, and Michael Berdalio have come out adamantly that a 72-year-old woman who lives in a one-room shack in Jigo owes Guam Water Authority $36,000. And the reason I am upset about that is because the Guam Water Authority is in such bad shape from a financial and a physical point of view that less than 50% of the water that gets pumped out of the aquifers goes through a meter. And while they're voting on giving themselves massive pay raises, and in the past attempting to give themselves pay raises and retroactive pay raises, they are insisting a 72-year-old woman who lives in a one-room shack in Jigo on a fixed income pay the full freight of $36,000. If we were to look back at all the illegal pay raises that the commissioners gave management, I wonder how many of those raises have been paid back. Because as I seem to recall, some of those managers who got massive retroactive pay raises and bonuses are on a payment plan, paying pennies on the dollar to the point it will take years for them to pay the money they owe back to GWA. And yet GWA is insisting that an impoverished woman on a fixed income pay money she can't afford to pay. That shows how disconnected our politicians and <clears throat> their minions are from the plight of our people. Let me refresh you on that. We're in our second year of a pandemic and through abuse of power, our politicians have basically destroyed the local economy. Now, there wasn't much they could do about the international tourism, but they sure as hell destroyed our local economy with the endless stream of public health emergency orders that shut down business after business, resulting in nearly 40,000 people losing their jobs, many of whom are still unemployed or working reduced hours to the point they can no longer afford to keep a roof over their head and put food on the table. And the governor is handing out pay raises piecemeal to government employees. Now, I don't fault the government employees for uh, receiving these pay raises. I just find fault with the governors and the senators and other politicians for the way they are going about doing it. It goes back to power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. We have so many instances of this happening. And as I talked about earlier this morning, talking about Guam Resource Recovery Partners and how they abused the taxpayers to the tune of maybe a million dollars. We don't know because they did it under the, you know, in back rooms. Then we have Guam YTK. Then we have uh, the Northern uh, North Point Market. And then we have Manhita Farms. We have Chamorro Land Trust properties. We have a lot of areas where our politicians are helping themselves at the public expense, and we need to stop that. The title of this post is The Power of the Power Tool of the People is Our Vote, but it only works when we use it. This election, we have an opportunity to change the government and make it more responsive to the people. And the way we do that is we break the barriers they keep the politically well-connected insiders in power and make 
the opportunity to serve open to all who feel the call to provide public service. Right now we have thousands of people who feel the urge to serve. I've been a community advocate for 15 years, standing up against politicians, government agencies, the legislature, boards and commissions, defending the people of Guam, but I'm not alone. There are hundreds of nonprofit organizations on this island, staffed with volunteers, people who commit of their heart and their time, their body and soul, and in many cases, their money, to provide services badly needed by our people. And when we look at that commitment to serve our people, it makes me proud to be a woman. So, Let's get on with the story. Right now, and I'm, I'm going to take a little detour, and that goes back to George Sadiyama, a philosopher who said, those who failed to learn the lessons of the past are doomed to repeat them. We as taxpayers have had plenty of opportunity to learn some very expensive lessons. Lessons where politically well-connected insiders help themselves to public assets, money and property. And I, let's think about the situation now with uh, the cigarette tax. And one of the politically well-connected insider cigarette alcohol distribution companies who didn't pay their taxes for years. Yet, Revan Tax continues to renew their business license. I think if Revan Tax said, we're not going to renew your business license until you pay all taxes due, those taxes would be paid immediately. But we don't know when the taxes are going to be paid because it's all, you know, sealed. We don't know, even know if they're paying the taxes, and we won't know until we get another administration in that has the balls to take a look at the situation and work for the people. We know the Attorney General won't do it. So that's one lesson of the past, because right now politicians then passed a law creating a pork barrel contract to give a privately owned company millions of dollars to collect the cigarette taxes that the companies who sell cigarette taxes should have been paying, but aren't. I have a real simple solution to that. If we created a regulation that says no cigarette containers will be released from the port or the airport until taxes are paid in full, and then let the distributors collect the refunds instead of sticking it on the backs of the taxpayers. Because right now, those millions of dollars in uncollected taxes were already spent by this government. That's why the government's been operating in the red for so many years, until they increased the business privilege tax, which made the cost of everything higher for people like you and me. And remember, the governor wants to keep this tax forever, forever. And it doesn't take into account the fact that we are dealing with a very, very hard hit population. Going into this pandemic, the economy was already going down the toilet. And since it was going down the toilet in 2019, based on the revenue collections, the first year of the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration was going to be a disaster. But fortunately for the administration, unfortunately for the people of Guam, a worldwide pandemic hit and Guam got hit with it. And along with that pandemic came billions of dollars of federal funds that got injected into our economy that more than offset the losses of the tourism industry and kept government of Guam afloat. But still, the 5% gross the 5% business privilege tax remains in force and the people of Guam are paying a very high price because two years into the pandemic, since the legislature surrendered their power to the governor, given her the ability to declare endless, endless 
public health care emergency so she can use those emergency powers to buy cat, bypass the procurement process and hand out pork barrel contracts left and right to politically well-connected insiders. In the last review, there were 27 pages of sole source, 27 pages representing millions of dollars of sole source contracts released by this governor and this administration. And in the meantime, our legislature, rather than reclaiming their power and representing the people and making sure that the governor is acting properly, they busied themselves with nothing renaming the southern villages. 40,000 people out of work in the legislature thought this was a good use of their time. 40,000 people wondering where they're going to get their next meal, how they're going to pay their bills, and this is the priority. Second only to lowering the age of sexual consent to 12-year-olds. I mean, really? That's a priority? Remember these names in the upcoming selection. Because as long as these people are running for office or get back into office, you can expect more of the same, which will neither make the people safer, healthier, or smarter. So what are the initiatives that we're talking about here? Well, the first initiative is no primary election. As you will see in future posts on Candid and Guam Citizens for Public Accountability, it's very difficult for new faces to get into office. And everyone complains about the fact that they're, they're, there's just the same people running for office over and over again until they get collected. Part of that reason is our fault. Part of the reason is we don't give new candidates a chance to prove themselves. And that's why they need to raise large sums of money so that they can buy the kind of media necessary to become familiar to you because that's the only way they can get into office. But the problem with that primary election campaign fundraising is that donors don't give very often to new names or faces because their donation will show up on campaign reports and they don't want to be penalized by the incumbents. They don't want to be penalized by the politically well-connected. The only way we break that cycle is we make it possible for new faces to run for office without having to incur tremendous amounts of debt because with great debt comes great political obligation and in future shows, I will show you exactly how much money it takes to get elected. Number two, <clears throat> part-time legislature. When you have people in the legislature full-time, that's when a lot of dumb law gets created. Things like the dumb hiker, dumb swimmer bill, the lower in the age of sexual consent to 12 years old, um, and the real and and the legislature rezones a lot of property, a lot of property. There's some streets where almost all the buildings on it have been rezoned by the legislature, not going through the territorial planning process. So, with a part-time legislature, we can ensure that the best and brightest will have the opportunity to serve. Because one of the biggest challenges I've faced as a community advocate trying to get people to run for office. Good people already have a job. Good people have a career. Good people have a business. And although they're willing to serve their community, and we see them do it now when they sponsor teams, uh, when they uh, volunteer in community organizations, they sit on boards and commissions, but those aren't full-time requirements. And if we made the legislature a part-time requirement, we would see those people once again stepping up to serve in one of the highest, most responsible positions on our island, and that is in the legislature that sets policy for the rest of our island. We also need to return to 21 senators. 
because right now with 15 senators and recent Supreme Court decisions, basically four senators could pass any law. We need to raise that threshold. By going to 21 senators, two things will happen. No longer will we concentrate so much power in so few hands, but we make it possible for good things to actually happen. Because when you're sitting on five, six, seven different committees, you become jack of all trades. You know what they say, uh, jack of all trades, master of none. We need to have our senators be able to spend time focusing on their committees. And the way that happens is we need more senators. This is not to save money. A part-time legislature isn't going to save money. 21 senators aren't going to save money. It's gonna cost us about as much to have a part-time legislature with 21 senators as it does to have a full-time legislature with 15 senators. The difference being we will have better quality people running for office and we will see better law coming out of their efforts. But to be sure, we need to pass the fourth initiative, which is the Corrupt Practices Act. Right now, politicians commit all kinds of misdeeds that end up costing taxpayers millions of dollars, and they get away with it. They get away with it because ordinary people don't know how to challenge it. The Attorney General isn't interested in prosecuting corruption or fraud, so it comes down to us. And right now, I have been very active. I've sued government of Guam about four times. And right now, I am in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is now in session. The Honorable Robert J. Torres, Associate Justice presiding. Would the clerk please call the case? This is Supreme Court case number CBA 20-008. Joaquin V. Leon Guerrero, individually and as a taxpayer, plaintiff appellant versus Government of Guam, Department of Administration, and Edward Byrne in his capacity as director, defendant's appellants. Appearing for the plaintiff appellant is attorney Braddock J. Huseman. Appearing for the defendant's appellees is attorney, attorney Jordan Lawrence Paloon. The panel consists of Associate Justice Robert J. Torres, Associate Justice Catherine A. Merriman, and Justice Pro Tem John A. Manglonia. Attorney Huseman reserves 10 minutes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, Attorney Huseman, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Braddock J. Huseman. I represent Mr. Leon Guerrero. May it please the court. This case began as a simple taxpayer case and has changed into something quite different. Now it is a case that involves this court's jurisdiction, uh, standing, and even the separation of powers. The Superior Court of Guam dismissed Mr. Leon Guerrero's taxpayer suit because he lacked a sufficiently concrete injury to satisfy the injury requirements found in the Article Three of the United States Constitution. The Superior Court came to that decision because of this court's opinion in what the briefing papers refer to as the airport case, in Ray AB Wanpat International Airport Authority, a two-year-old case. The Superior Court interpreted a few paragraphs of dicta within the airport case to conclude that in all cases in Guam, courts require a federal Article III standing analysis, particularly as it pertains to injuries. The Superior Court's interpretation, however, is incorrect. The U.S. Constitution does not mandate Article III requirements on the island of Guam, and neither does the Organic Act. In fact, the requirement of an Article III injury, in fact, upends literally decades of case law on Guam. Worse, the requirement of an Article III injury, in fact, in all cases, as an irreducible minimum, jeopardizes a host of Guam statutes, as well as this court's own original jurisdiction and several opinions rendered thereunder. Mr. Leon Guerrero asked that this court reverse the Superior Court's decision, that it harmonize its case law, and that it remand the case to the Superior Court for further proceedings. With my time today, I'd like to discuss three main points. First, there is no irreducible minimum of a case or controversy requirement on Guam. Second is that the Superior Court erred in its interpretation of the airport case. 
And finally, that if the uh, Superior Court's decision is allowed to stand, if this court does not harmonize its case law, there are catastrophic implications for jurisprudence on Guam. The reason why this is so critical is the reason I am fighting in the Supreme Court is you heard the Attorney I mean, General's office and this administration are trying to make it impossible for any taxpayer, any voter, to hold, hold government officials accountable for their actions. And we look at the long list of corrupt acts performed by government officials and they got away scot-free. That's why we need to have a law in place that allows citizens to bring actions against the government. And the reason this is important to us is, hold on, I'm coming down to, all right, wait a minute, wait a minute. Da -da -da. I'm a, a one-man production studio here. But it comes back to... All right. There's A. And B. There we go. An elected public prosecutor, our current attorney general, elected by the people of Guam, supposedly to represent the people of Guam, protect and defend the people of Guam, fails every time. He represents the government and makes no bones about it. And that's why he's in the Supreme Court of Guam right now, fighting against the right of taxpayers and citizens to hold government accountable for acts of illegal acts and actions that are against law, policy, or procedure that cost taxpayers money. Because the only way these things happen is when we don't act. But up until now, very few of us had the will or the tools to act. The Corrupt Practices Act will help us in an elected public prosecutor will be the champion of the people because the attorney general represents government of Guam. That position has been clear ever since the position was created. And even when it went to elected attorney generals, they all represent the government of Guam. They're conflicted out and they do not answer to the people. We need our own Jack McCoy for you law and order fans. We need a prosecutor, someone who will look at white collar crime and corruption and act accordingly. Someone who will take serious his ch charge to protect the people. Unlike the current attorney general we have, who runs a catch and release program that drives the police officers crazy because many times the attorney general's office is releasing people before the police officers have finished the paperwork. That's why we see people being arrested two or three times on pretrial release while they're waiting to go to trial on their first arrest. We need a prosecutor that's going to put an end to that. We need a champion for the people. And that's where we need our own version of Jack McCoy. Next, we need to revise the Office of Public Accountability Powers Act. The Office of Public Accountability, or our public auditor right now, former Speaker, former Supreme Court Judge B.J. Cruz, soon we will have another one, and he needs the power and tools that B.J. doesn't have right now, and that is the ability to prosecute fraud and abuse. Currently, whenever the Office of Public Accountability which oversees a billion dollar budget and billions of dollars worth of contracts and expenditures, finds fraud or abuse, they have to turn it over to the Attorney General's office. And very often the Attorney General's office then files it in the circular file and nothing happens. We need to have our Office of Public Accountability, public auditor to have the same power to prosecute fraud and abuse that 
the Attorney General has. Our public auditor needs to be able to bring legal actions against people that have committed fraud or, or abuse with public funds. It's not happening now and it needs to happen because as long as politically well-connected insiders feel they can get away from these things, we're gonna see it continue to happen. And I refer back to my example this morning from the Guam Solid Waste. I'll bring that slide up for the benefit of those of you who didn't see it this morning. But Guam Solid Waste, let's blow it up. In the course of the investigation, the receiver found that the equipment rentals were running $11,000 a day. And when they got in to examine why Guam, government of Guam equipment wasn't working, why Guam Solid Waste, then DPW, was issuing emergency uh, procurement orders that bypassed the procurement process to the tune of $11,000 a day, he learned that one item, an excavator, which was costing taxpayers just under $1,500 a day to rent, all it needed was a new starter motor. So the receiver spent $860 to buy a new starter motor, saving taxpayers ultimately $1,500 a day. But for the two plus years this had been happening, what we were looking at was somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 million of taxpayer funds. They got diverted away from things like school maintenance or even government building maintenance or new school buses. $11,000 a day got diverted from government of Guam Treasury into private hands. That's the penalty we pay as citizens, voters, and taxpayers when we put too much trust in public officials and not holding them accountable for the trust we give them. We can change that this election. Go online to Guam Election Commission website and you can check whether or not you are registered to vote. A lot of you aren't. After all, politicians deleted nearly 10,000 voters in the first month of the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration because high voter turnouts are bad for incumbents. So when you find out you're elected, you're, I mean, you're registered, that's great. The next step is to vote and also to vote for these initiatives, one through six, because these initiatives, if we pass them, we prevent the continuation of the abuse of the public assets by politically well-connected insiders. So you can go online, Guam Election Commission website, and if you're not registered, you can register online or you can call 671-477-9791. And when you call that number, you can talk to Guam Election Commission and find out if you are um, uh, registered to vote. And if you're not, you can vote, you can register to vote online or you can go to their office on OCA. Uh, Fahrenheit Drive in Oka Tamuni. I'm Ken Leon Guerrero. You can send me an email at kenleonguerrero at yahoo.com or you can leave a message on my cell phone, 671-727-4321. But when all of us work together, we create a better future for our people and our island. And that's important because right now we're coming out of a pandemic and we need to take power out of the hands of politically well-connected insiders so that the hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in the government of Guam Treasury get spent to benefit the people, not the pork barrel politicians. See you at 2 o'clock from Jonia Community Center.